Thanks, Leona. So on the agenda today, folks, the um, uh, usual first couple of items. We have any apologies for absence? Uh, I don't have any apologies today. OK, thank you. And uh, item number two, declarations of interest. Do we have any? Oh, great, thanks. Uh, just so you know, we've, so we've got items three, four and five, which are uh, papers from the education uh, officers. And the, the last item, item six, is a presentation from the director, Mark. I, the, the presentation is about roughly 20, 25 minutes, possibly. So just to give you an idea of um, time-wise, because you know, we have something obviously after this, conscious of that. So I move on to item number three. The, it, and this is from, uh, I believe, Graham. It's uh, the results of the consultation on the provision of early learning and childcare. Graham, thank you. Yeah, uh, thank you very much, Convener. Um, so the purpose of this report is to inform members of the results of the biennial consultation on the provision of early learning childcare or the ELC within East Renfrewshire uh, and subsequently set out the Department's proposals to continue to increase flexibility for families through the models of provision to be made available from August 2023. Just in terms of the background to this process, the Children and Young People Act uh, 2014 requires all education authorities to consult with families every two years on the provision of ELC and prepare a delivery plan to meet these needs. This process follows up on the previous consultation exercise undertaken in late 2020, which was brought to committee in early 2021. Elected members will be very familiar with the work undertaken by the Education Department over recent years to deliver on the expansion of early learning and childcare and make provision for the 1140 hours statutory entitlement for children young, or young people. As members will recall, the Education Committee took the decision to make 1140 available to families from the original uh, implementation date of August 2020, ahead of the delayed implementation of August 2021 due to COVID. And as a department, um, we continue to make provision available as soon as we can for families ahead of any national requirements. Paragraphs 5 and, five and 6 detail the breadth of settings and models that are currently available for families to choose from, with flexibility really being a key part of the delivery of the entitlement and this recognises the different needs and circumstances of families across East Renfrewshire. Moving on to the main body of the report, uh, elected members will note that the consultation exercise ran throughout October, and primarily been undertaken online, and asked a range of different questions about the provision of ELC and family preferences. Full information on the questions and the responses is provided in the appendix. In terms of just some of the key issues raised, members will note the summary provided in paragraph 9, which outlines the main findings from the consultation. Uh, I'd like to just draw members' attention to subparagraph C in particular, with families indicating fairly strongly that their child's allocation meets the needs of their family. Given that this has been an important aspect of the expansion programme, this is, of course, very encouraging. In addition, members will note that throughout the responses, there is a recurring theme about the availability of additional hours above the statutory entitlement. Given the restrictions that have been in place um, for much of the last two years and the limits on capacities and, and what we've been able to provide, we've unfortunately been able to make this offer available widespread for families to access. However, with the easing since the spring, I am pleased that we've been able to start rolling this out across some settings where capacity has allowed. And whilst it's been more limited, um, given the high demand for nursery spaces, this has been very welcomed by families and something we're looking to expand on. So building on this feedback for the forthcoming session, families will have the option to be able to uh, increase the number of additional hours that they are able to access, supplementing their child's statutory entitlement and further increasing the flexibility of the offer. Obviously, this will be dependent where we can fit it in with capacity. This has been received very positively in the consultation and it's anticipated this will be a popular choice for families where we can make it available. Finally, I would just like to draw members' attention to paragraphs 15 and 16, detailing the responses we have received on the deferral process. Members will be aware um, that changes have been introduced from August next year will enable children deferring age to P1 to access the additional year of funded early learning and childcare. Um, in terms of the response, approximately 20% of those responding indicated it would be very likely to choose to defer uh, and choose to access this. Um, this provides a bit of a helpful guide for the Department. I think it's maybe worth noting that in the consultation we didn't ask for any specifics on dates of birth and things, so it may not provide a, a total overview, but it's certainly a helpful guide. Um, to support the planning for the department. Uh, and as noted, we will be continuing to learn from the national pilots um, that are underway um, to ensure our own readiness um, for that process coming in from next year. 
So, in conclusion, members will note that the Department has continued to engage with families across East Renfrewshire to ensure our continued adherence to the principles of quality, flexibility, affordability and accessibility, remaining responsive to the needs of our residents. Through the consultation, families have specifically highlighted the need for continued flexibility and additional supplementary hours, which the Department will be looking to make available on a more widespread basis from August 2023. So, convener, elected members asked to note the results of the ELC consultation and note the proposals to further increase flexibility for families to address the additional demand. Thank you. Excellent, great. Thank you, Graham. Uh, as you mentioned, there were to, I've been asked to note the results and the department's proposals. Uh, do we have any comments or from councillors or members? Councillor Wallace. I did just to commend the Education Department on, um, on the work that they've done on this over the years. It's just a pity it's 30 years too late. Um, just looking at that personally. <laughs> um, the, uh, I'm aware of a, a huge amount of effort that, that's been put into this. I wonder if I could just, with your permission, um, Chair, just bring... We seem to have managed to build in and put a, a lot of effort into the, the early years and seem to build in a huge amount of um, capacity, if you like, or a reasonable amount of capacity in here. But I was just very, very concerned to hear that uh, just last week at a, it was at a planning meeting, uh, there was a, a planning application came forward in which was going to provide something like 40 jobs to the area, huge leisure facility, great open uh, to, to everybody, very affordable, and yet as a result they had to build six homes in which to um, enable this to, to actually come about. But it would appear that we do not have the capacity built into our education system that is so tight that the proposal was rejected on the basis that uh, the words that were used here is that six homes would put a significant education capacity issue um, for the education department. I wonder if I might ask that the flexibility that's clearly been put into the early years, which is uh, very welcome, uh, are we in the situation in which we are absolutely full to capacity with the other schools? And whether or not, and if, if that is the case, what are we doing about trying to um, increase the capacity there so that we're not faced with this uh, situation? Thank you, Chair, for your Thank patience. you, Councillor Walls. Uh, I do actually, um, I was at Maidenhill Parent Council the other night, and this came up um, because the parents there were concerned to hear that also, that the, the terms of the capacity. I have not had actually had a chance to, um, to talk to the director about it yet, but uh, I'd imagine, uh, yeah, one of the officers will address that. Thank you. I can maybe give a wee bit uh, in the sort of early years, and you'll know that many of our early years offer a full year service, and also because of the models of delivery, for every one space we can potentially have two children. So that's where that flexibility comes from. It's just that um, efficiency of how we allocate places. So we have children that maybe attend three days a week or two days a week or two and a half. And we've also got the advantage of working in partnership with funded providers. So the flexibility um, doesn't come from having less children. It just comes from we've got a wee bit more scope to offer different models, whereas in schools they, they don't have that, that sort of provision um, or that ability to do so. So that's the early side, your side of it. Yep, thank you. And from the primary and secondary side of things, that I believe the catchment area for those particular properties was in within the Maiden Hill and the Mearns Castle catchment area. And of course, those have been planned through in terms of those schools for the developments that are currently taking place there. And as you would imagine, at this particular point in time, those properties, as they are arising and being developed, we are seeing significant numbers of children coming out of those properties for those places which are planned for. And therefore, those numbers have been planned over a period of time for those particular properties to accommodate those children on an ongoing basis. And what we are anticipating, what we plan for, is that we will see that spike and that the schools that have been built at the moment have been planned for that spike and that thereafter, once we have that natural overtaking of families moving into those properties and as they become established properties, we would then see that that would decrease and that the school would move into a normal process of that annual refurbishment or that annual change of families as they move into the catchment area for those particular schools. Thank you. 
Yeah, sorry, Chair. The, it's just a major concern that um, what we try and do, and what I believe we've been trying to aim for in this uh, council, is to try and get rid of the, the kind of silo operations that everybody is working together. And I would just felt that from an economic perspective, that particular issue that we have there, six homes, I mean, unless each of these six homes that the parents happen to have all have twins and they all happen to be at the age of 11 or so, I could understand there'd be a major issue. But when it's spread over secondary and primary, that we do not have the capacity that is really, it's had a significant impact, I would say, in my view, uh, on, the, on what would have been a very welcome economic benefit uh, to the area. And I, I would just ask if the Education Department could maybe just revisit this and just have a, a closer look and just see about the advice that is being given to the Planning Department, just so we've got a level playing field here. So that, as you're mentioning, Chair, about uh, your own uh, community council being very concerned about it. So thank you. That was the parent council. But, you know, but, yeah. Uh, any other comments on Councillor Buchanan? Oh, ah, sorry, Councillor Merrick. Thank you, Chair. Uh, just to thank Graham for the report. Uh, like Councillor Wallace to commend the Education Department and what is another great success. I think if uh, we just look at one of the numbers, I'll, I'll be very brief about this, that indicates that success. Uh, and it was uh, the bit where we talk about uh, how people rate their child's allocation. You know, you get 70% responding with a four or five. And the reason for the low scores is simply, could be the reasons where they weren't able to get the first preference uh, location or they weren't able to add uh, or, or purchase more. So uh, I think that in itself indicates a great success. Well done to the education department. And as always, there's no resting on, on the laurels here because we're gonna try to do more flexibility and, and expand what we're doing and, and cope with the, the fact that we have now got people, more people probably going to defer next year. So well done and thank you for the report. Thank you, Councillor Merrick. Uh, Councillor Buchanan. Yeah, thanks, Chair. Again, just to, to very much welcome the report. I think it is uh, a really a very good news story, given the circumstances that we faced um, over the last few years. So I think that it shows that the decision to continue with the rollout uh, when it could have been delayed or could have been postponed for a period of time was the right decision. Uh, it shows that we were, we were keen to continue to do the work and to deliver for our residents, and I think that is more than apparent. Uh, it comes across in the paper. So again, I think thanks to all of the, the work that's been done and the hard work, uh, because you've got to bear in mind not only did we have the pandemic, but we were also at the construction phase of building the, the nurseries as well going on. Uh, so huge congratulations, I think, for getting to that stage and getting to the stage we are now at and continuing to work with. Uh, it shows that uh, our pride in the education services that we deliver is still very much top of the agenda and that we hope to continue to be able to do that. So. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Buchanan. Oh, your microphone. Sorry. Right. Uh, Councillor O'Donnell. Uh, thanks. Um, a couple of points. Again, you know, it's really welcome that this is a very popular service for, for the parents and children of East Renfrewshire, so that's excellent. First question is really on eligibility. So of all of those parents or children that are entitled to a place, how many are actually taking that up? That's the first point. And then the second point is really about funding. There's a couple of uh, comments here that allude to a funding gap for these services, one in 24, which is um, receive a fair funding settlement to meet the true costs. So it suggests there is a gap there. So it'd be interesting to know what that gap is. And then secondly, we talk about the, the automatic deferrals uh, for uh, age five children. Um, what is the, and I think the, the stats was 20% may be wanting to consider that. So quite a chunk. Have we got an estimate of what the funding gap um, for that would be and whether those gaps have been reflected in, in the budget conversations we're gonna have later today? Thank you. 
Thank you, Councillor. Uh, Thank you, uh, thank you Councillor O'Donnell. Um, so, in terms of the, so your first point, just about that kind of access to eligibility, certainly three to five year olds, which is obviously the kind of main chunk, I, I think it's almost all uh, are accessing it. I mean, you know, there will be some parents who maybe choose not to for whatever reason, but almost all. Um, two year olds have certainly made big progress. There still remain some, pay, you know, they are t it's the, you know, it's those on lower incomes or, or a range of other circumstances. So, there are sometimes more challenges in trying to get those children in. What we are having, uh, and certainly it's going to be a big help for us, is the data that the DWP share. And they're creating a new process which allows some data sharing there, which will allow us then to actually be able to target those families much better, which that's one of the challenges because we've been having to rely on, you know, our work with health visitors and things to make that, which is often really, you know, it's really good work, but it's maybe sometimes people aren't identified there. So that DWP work will certainly be a really big help, and that's due to come in in the next few months, actually, which will really help on that. Um, on, on the funding, if I, I'll go ask my colleague Janice to come in just specifically on that, um, if we can come to that, but certainly just on that final point on the deferrals, um, that is certainly through the, the kind of uh, spending pressures um, that's been identified by the department as one of the spending pressures. I think you're right. I think the estimate of how many children may choose to do it is still a wee bit of a, a, an unknown to some regard. I mean, I think we have a large proportion of those who are the January February birthdays who are already accessing that obviously choose to do so and you know um, that's always going to be a larger proportion than what maybe the August to December ones will be. But ultimately it will it will depend. And I think what we will probably see is quite a variation across different parts of the authority as well. Uh, so obviously coming in for the first year we'll have to plan where we are doing a bit of well, a lot of prep work to try and identify where we think some of that pressure may be. But that's certainly going to be a kind of uh, there is going to be a pressure on but you know we're not going to be from that. Um, but that is reflected through the spending pressures uh, and the budget process. Yeah. If I could just pick up on deferral before I talk about the funding gap as well. Um, although that the paper suggests one in five for those who took part, at the moment those who have been entitled to automatic deferral in East Remshire, it is over a third who take up that opportunity. And we've been looking closely at this over the past few years, um, and it tends to be more children who live in our areas of SIMD 9 and 10 than those who live in SIMD 1 and 2. Um, however, we've not get, we can't actually do any sort of sophisticated planning because it's not even if we say it's an extra 50 children, um, they might be scattered across the catchments of our, our communities that our nurseries are based in. So it's a real challenge, and that's why we have included it as part of the P1 enrolment process because the quicker we know where there is, and it kind of impacts on the sort of flexibility aspect because if we have more children deferral, deferring, we won't be able to offer more opportunities for parents to have full-time places, nor necessarily um, be able to offer parents who are not entitled. So at the moment, parents who have children three and under have an opportunity to purchase places, and that's a very popular um, it's very popular with parents that they can purchase that place, but it's also an income generator. So that's reflected as well that the, the education department has very limited income generators, and one of these income generators is um, maybe under threat, depending on um, the deferral. The, moving on to the funding gap, um, there was a, a slightly different model of um, funding when the expansion was planned and uh, we didn't know how, nobody really knew how that funding model would work out but they used data around birth rates that didn't necessarily reflect the growth in birth rate in East Rain or indeed the migration. Um, so we found that we were short and the council um, supported the, the expansion by, um, in particular, the capital, and they supported the building of the new building so that we could, um, and I think we, I'm quoting Education Committee at the time, we, or, we offered a gold standard um, service and the, it was important the council carried on doing that. Unfortunately, the revenue um, gap has continued to increase. We were able to sort of save up, and at the time of the expansion, we were encouraged to to have early pilots, and we had very few pilots because we sort of rolled that money over every year so that this year would be the first real year of gap. So we have saved, we have scrimped, and um, however, 
that it is over a million pounds that that gap. Um, 1.2 was the last official figure, but it could go. I mean, depending on deferral, and I think the challenge is that we are awaiting uh, the funding model moving forward, and we are hopeful that that gap will be addressed. Um, but um, if not, then we will go through the, the mechanisms to highlight that to elected members through um, spending pressures and, and due course. Can I, can I just come back in, please? Sorry, yeah, Councillor Dunn. Um, that's very helpful. Thank you, Janice. That 1.2 million, so that's including deferral and uh, or, or, or it's excluding the it's deferral? It's excluding right? deferral at this stage, so but we are anticipating funding for deferral. Right. So we're, we're anticipating funding for deferral and funding for how we continue to deliver 1140 moving forward. Okay, thank you. Great, thank you. Um, just a couple of comments, maybe, and a question uh, from my, my, <coughs> myself, hopefully. Um, a, interesting to hear, like, uh, well, first of all, what Councillor Buchanan touched on about it was great to be at Cross Arthur uh, on Friday and the, the, the legacy, you know, the, the delivering a nursery, you know, of that quality is, in this area is just fantastic. Um, but talking about um, the Councillor Merrick touched on it um, about first choice, where that's where there was a. Is, is that a trend that I'm concerned about capacity if people, uh, is it in particular areas um, where parents, you know, don't get the first choice nursery and they have to, their child, they have to travel elsewhere? So all of our nurseries are organised in communities. So we have the kind of four communities. So whereas people, you know, they don't work on catchments as such, and that provides people with the choice. So what it means is that you know within each community there's a range of different settings that also offer a range of different models, um, which provides people with the choice. So they're not just relying on you know what the nursery that's closest to their house, which might only offer um, certain models. I would just say we did a wee bit of an evaluation just in terms of off the back of the application process, and so for the current session. Um, and on the, those who had submitted their applications on time, um, which was you know, the kind of application window that we had open at the beginning of 2022, 94% of applications got their first choice of setting. Now, obviously, there's a range of different models within each setting, and we have to sometimes, you know, people have to have a range of flexibility in terms of what they're also able to take on. Um, but 94% getting their first choice of setting, which obviously comes through the report as well, that setting tends to be the priority for people. Um, so that's certainly what we prioritise. But that was a really encouraging figure as well, uh, and obviously demonstrates the, you know, the increase in capacity and things that we've been able to put in has given people that choice, which is really important. Thank you. Um, can I also ask as well uh, about the strong preference of respondents to be able to purchase additional... Um, do we have any idea of like, are the majority of the people who are using or utilising it, is it parents that are working full-time? Or... I, I mean, I think that, that is obviously the kind of... When we look at the kind of wider demographics of East Renfrewshire, that would be you know, what, what you know, parents do tend to to be um, an employment. Um, I think it comes to it, certainly we'd saw that the 55%, I think it was, who'd said they would be looking at that full-time option um, is obviously a, a popular choice. Um, we have a range of funded providers that currently offer that, uh, and a, it's obviously a popular choice for families who wish to access that. Um, so it is something we're trying to reflect and make sure that we can get on board. But, you know, families have a range of different reasons that they'll take that. Um, employment, education, study, training, you know, a whole range of different things that they will obviously take on board uh, and they'll need to reflect and have their sort of childcare needs met and because of those. All right, thank you. Uh, and just for one final thing, um, we touched in Cabinet about the risk register and actually within it, the, um, about funding, budget cost, um, there was the worry that, um, and it's interesting to hear that at Cabinet and then talk about it here that there is a concern that, that somehow this excellent service could be disrupted. Um, and, and I think it is very difficult to quantify at this stage because we don't know the deferral. And another aspect is that at the last committee we agreed the sustainable rate, which is increasing what we pay funded providers. And parents have the choice through funding follows the child policy to pick. So, the, do you mean, although previously we would have limited the amount of money or budget we used to, to fund providers, we can't now. If parents choose to go with that provider, we need to fund that, and that all comes out of that one um, pot that that we're hoping will be 
funded in a different way. Well, we're aware it's going to be funded in a different way, but it, it is a pressure that we've been highlighting for five years now. OK, thank you. I'm well, conscious of time, and I think it's interesting, actually, that there's so many different questions that shows you how important uh, this service actually is. Um, OK, any other comments or questions on this item on the agenda? No? Great, thank you. Um, OK, we'll move on to the next item on the agenda. Um, a agenda. Agenda item number four, and a support of leave from you, Janice. Um, and the purpose is to update the Education Committee on the Education Department's progress implementing priorities associated with National Improvement Framework. I am asked to note and comment on the progress. Thank you. Thank you, Convener. The purpose of the report is to update the Education Committee on the Education Department's progress in implementing the priorities associated with the National Improvement Framework for Scottish Education, also known as the NIF. On the 6th of January 2016, the Scottish Government launched the NIF for Scottish Education. The framework is intended to drive both excellence and equity in Scottish education and is reviewed annually. The 2022 National Improvement Framework and Improvement Plan was published in December 2021. As detailed on page 18, paragraph 5, the NIF is underpinned by a series of planning and reporting duties designed to support transparency and accountability around the efforts of the Scottish Government and education authorities to improve educational outcomes and support system-wide improvement. Once again, given the ongoing COVID pandemic and context, local authorities were not required to report to the Scottish Government on the themes detailed on page 17 in paragraph 3. However, high-level, evidence-based internal quality assurance by our schools and the department has allowed us to report on the continuous improvement in East Renfrewshire and evaluate the impact of our commitment to supporting children, families and school communities throughout the crisis and the return to pre-pandemic ways. The department evaluates its progress annually to identify strengths in current provision and areas where further improvement is required. Evidence gathered from the self-evaluation and evaluations of services and schools by the Department's Quality Improvement Team, Education Scotland, Care Inspectorate and the Customer Service Excellence Report is used to identify steps which need to be taken to secure continuous improvement. As a result of the COVID-19 pandemic, evidence for the report was limited to the following sources. Performance and questionnaire data, reports on schools and nurseries from the Quality Improvement Team, thematic reviews by Education Scotland, reports on early learning childcare centres by Care Inspectorate, school and service improvement plans and standard quality reports, and as, I, and as aforementioned, customer service excellence review. The appendix that can be found on page 21 to 41 details the progress made in the key themes. Highlights include the levels of attainment of East Renfrewshire pupils at S4 to S6 has continued to be high over the last five years the ongoing commitment to learning and teaching and, in particular, assessment and moderation, the range of professional learning opportunities and resources offered by the Educational Psychology Service to support schools to respond effectively to social and emotional concerns and maximise the attendance of more vulnerable individuals, and the number of children participating as measured by the National Participation Measure. In conclusion, a relentless focus by the Department of Schools to raise the bar for all learners and, at the same time, reduce the inequalities of outcomes experienced by our more disadvantaged children and young people has continued despite the challenging context. Progress towards the four national priorities as set out in the NIF has continued to be impacted by the disruption caused by the pandemic. Education Committee is asked to note and comment on the Education Department's progress in implementing priorities associated with the National Improvement Framework. Thank you, Convener. Thank you, Janice. And uh, can I ask for any comments or any questions from members? No? Oh, Mr Councillor Buchanan. Yeah, thanks, Chair. Again, just to, to welcome the report. And, uh, as, you know, and I think it shows, uh, again, touching on the previous report, a lot of the excellent work that follows on and what we do to deliver on the outcomes for our children. And I think it's also uh, worth noting that we are currently in the process of having a national conversation on where education goes in the future. And in some respects, 
this report provides a lot of the basis for that because it's looking at the outcomes, it's looking at how we deliver education in future, uh, what happens with qualifications and what qualifications are actually required, and what skill sets that we need to provide for our children for future years. And that touches on everything from providing well-being, it touches on looking at a, a, an economy which is based, based on, if you like, community wealth building uh, to ensure that our children in, in the future have the skill sets that are required for the employability, or the employment opportunities that will be created in, in years to come. So it's all very much relevant, and this touches on taking those outcomes and moving it to another stage to keep us and to continue uh, as being in a sector leading environment. So, yeah, well done, everyone, again. Thank you, Councillor Buchanan. Uh, Councillor Campbell. Thank you, Convener. Um, it, it is a great report. It's, it's great to see, um, as usual, uh, great outcomes um, in East Renfrewshire for our, our children. I, I want to note, though, on um, page 31, it is, you know, there's the pandemic thing, but it is hugely disappointing to see um, such a decrease in the attainment in reading, writing, talking and listening um, in our primary schools. Uh, but what is a positive thing, and it's, it, I find it very, very interesting, um, is that there has been an increase in attainment in numeracy, although there's a decrease in attainment across all the other um, disciplines. And I just wonder if... Um, could that be... There is a huge emphasis on STEM... Um, which I've noted in all my time as a mum, kids at school, it's STEM, STEM, STEM. And um, could it be that um, this is a result of that? And um, the fact that there has been an increase in the numeracy and a decrease in everything else, um, could we maybe learn something from that? Is there something that is being done in the numeracy that has allowed this increase in attainment and it's not happening in the other disciplines. We, Thank you. I, I mean, it's a very interesting point, and I, I know that we've taken a closer look. And for a lot of the decreases, it stems from our younger children, who during the pandemic did not have that social interaction, who were not in school, they were not in nursery, they were not. Nobody was coming to visit the house or visit the home, um, it's, and I. Reading and writing really is built on that talking and listening. For our older kids who were at school, what we've noticed is they actually preferred doing maths online, and I think I commented on that when I brought the, the report on online learning. I think, um, and I'm very conscious that my director has got a doctorate in mathematics, and he might give me a route at any moment, but maths sometimes can be black and white. <laughs> and uh, I think... Um, English and literacy can sometimes be a wee bit open, more open-ended, um, and I'm aware of problem-solving and all sorts of things. But um, so I think young folk found that very challenging to engage with literacy when they're at home. We had a very interesting presentation, and it would be good maybe to share it with the Education Committee in the future from our literacy principal teachers that we employ in authority to address that gap, where they have looked a wee bit closer at the reasons why literacy has um, plummeted in, in certain aspects in certain schools and certain age groups and what they are doing to build it up and it really is based on that talking and listening social interaction, playful pedagogy and we are beginning to see the results of it and interestingly enough they were able to demonstrate yesterday that although there's been a gap at certain points, the progress that's been made by the time the children leave primary school, that sort of value added and I think it will be demonstrated in the director's presentation in a moment that they're making those gains and we're, they're, they're where we want them to be by the time they leave school. But that's a, um, as a primary practitioner, what you're about to see, I would argue that, that a lot of the hard work's taking place before they've even got to high school. But um, So we are keeping a close eye on it. I don't think we're doing anything different in numeracy than we are in maths. We've got both good strategies. The math strategies was just reviewed and parents were very positive that one of the... the 
aims of that math strategy was to engage children in maths. Um, I think people, um, I think a lot of people find it easier to say, oh, I'm not good at maths, or, uh, yet people won't say they're not good at reading because there's maybe a value statement by uh, the public and the community. So we have invested a lot in maths, but we're about to review our literacy as well. But I do think um, it's not about focusing on the pandemic because we are coming out of it. It's what we're going to do now about it. But we are picking up that a lot of it was to do with that lack of interaction, that lack of talking, that lack of that being on a screen and no visitors, nobody saying hello, nobody, so especially with our younger children. Keith, okay, thank you. That's interesting. Thank you very much. Thank you, Councillor Campbell, Janice. Uh, Councillor Zono. Um, again, <coughs> with, with other members, welcome this report. Um, a lot of progress. Um, and again, a very difficult year uh, with COVID. Um, and obviously we're seeing that particular impact in primary children, which is obviously going to be an area of focus for this council for the next years in terms of how we, we recover that gap. Um, but again, as I think uh, Councillor, Pra um, pra no, Councillor Campbell said, um, really encouraging that we didn't see that impact on secondary uh, education, which might be because there's proportionately less impact compared to very early uh, children. So that was encouraging that we were still able to progress uh, through a COVID environment. So it shows the potential of what we can do uh, when, when, uh, uh, when we're back to the new normal. So that was very encouraging. Um, on the attainment gap, this may link to the next se section on, on, on stretch targets. Um, but since we've been, been talking about it a bit and it's in the paper, um, one thing that I'm particularly interested in is the, obviously we're looking at the poverty attainment gap, which everyone is completely supportive of, of focusing on that. Do we have any drill down data or should we be monitoring um, the gender gap within that, how that plays out? And also ethnic uh, minority gap, if, if it, such a thing exists. It's interesting to hear the views and whether we should be actually monitoring that, although it's not a statutory obligation as part of this committee's work. Thank you. Yes, thank you. That is something, <clears throat> pardon me, that we do focus on in both of those characteristics of, of young people, um, particularly with regards to particular areas of the curriculum. So, for example, <coughs> pardon me again, in terms of the primary sector, we'll often see a, varied, a variety in terms of outcomes for children in literacy uh, areas with you know, traditionally, the, the, the outcomes being less successful for boys than they are for girls. And of course, that varies across establishments based on the, the interventions each establishment is putting in place to um, work on those and to improve those outcomes. And I know that the director, through his presentation, has some charts that we'll focus on that will make a reference to the difference between boys and girls. Uh, and similarly, in terms of ethnicity and such, like again, that's another area that we do focus on, um, again, uh, in great detail. And we do provide that support to our establishments. Again, they will vary on their demographics, and it's important that we focus on that. But we often have a particular focus on um, independent and different discrete ethnic minority groups where we don't see the outcomes as successful as they are in other um, places or for other children. And we do look to highlight that and to support our establishments to, to work towards improving those outcomes. Um, through you, Camilla. Um, maybe just to give a little bit of reassurance to Councillor O'Donnell. Um, whilst the sort of main focus of the Scottish Attainment Challenge is on that poverty-related attainment gap, which I think is right because of the, the clear evidence there in terms of different outcomes, there is that expectation that local authorities will look at the gaps that exist in that broader range in terms of equity. So whether that's children with additional support needs, whether that's those, as you say, in terms of the gender group, um, or ethnic minorities. We've looked at ethnic minorities given the sort of demographic within East Renfrewshire for a long period. What is encouraging it to see is if you track that through in a sort of longitudinal way, that actually by the time you get to kind of uh, the senior phase, if you look at sort of some of the attainment measures or you look at leaver destinations, actually our children from ethnic minorities tend to outperform those from the sort of white Scottish background. Actually, poverty tends to be the bigger factor there in terms of that longer uh, picture. The gender one is a very difficult one. Our schools have been working on that. They'll do a lot of professional inquiry with the staff, trying to build that capacity. It is a, an ongoing focus. It was something when I started as a teacher that was an issue in terms of outcomes and that differential. Um, it is still an issue. Um, I was actually in discussion with the head teacher at St Ninians this week, um, where 
one of their teachers in computing had won a sort of national award um, for the work that they had been doing around supporting girls and encouraging girls into that area in computing, done a very successful coding club um, that now is overspilling, um, involving senior pupils, bringing in um, sort of leaders from across um, uh, different various employers that are inspiring girls into that area, and they had seen a significant increase in, in computing as a result of the, the work that this teacher had done, so that they were now around about a third of the, the young people choosing computing were uh, girls. Still, a, still further work to do. We want to get beyond that to sort of e uh, that equality in that way, but that's a kind of example of the things that the schools are looking at at their different gaps um, uh, in that way. Okay, Councillor O'Donnell. Um, thanks for that. Um, that's, that's helpful to know, and I sort of assumed that we would be doing all of that good stuff. So I suppose it's a question then for the committee whether we should be looking at that, that sort of data on a regular basis, probably as part of that attainment gap, or the, the drill down of it, so that we've got a better understanding of where and why and how we're dealing with some of it. So it's, it's something I perhaps we should consider, Chair. Okay, thank you. Councillor O'Donnell, noted, I believe. Councillor Merrick wanted to. Oh, yes, sorry, I've noticed, thanks. Uh, and Councillor Merrick. Thanks, Chair. Uh, I'm pleased to hear about uh, the computing teachers that many is encouraging girls to get involved in computing, or more, more girls get to get involved. Of course, the inventor of computer programming was a guy. Just a piece of useless information. That's not what I was going to talk about. But uh, So uh, I was looking at page, well, I was looking at a lot of pages. a very comprehensive report. Thank you very much for it, Janice. A lot of stuff in here. Uh, but I was looking at uh, page 31 in particular, about closing the gap. And yeah, you would expect during a pandemic there would be all kinds of challenges there. But of course, the people or the the, the, the children who get hit the hardest seem to be DESAs 1 and 2 of SIMD. They've they been absolutely hammered with a, with a decrease. So I kind of want to know what can we do in particular for the children who are hit the hardest here. And another point that I wanted to make was on page 35, where we use some of the PES, PEF funding to help reduce the cost of the school day. I think that's a fantastic way to use PEF money too, because all that school uniforms, the rest of it, all that feeds into uh, the, the sort of love of education, the, the ability of children to move forward with confidence. Uh, so I'd like any comments about that. And the cost of the school uniform is very, very difficult. Do we use uh, Back to School Bank and, and other organisations like that to help ease that burden? on parents who need it most. Thank you. I, I think the cost of school day and the work that's been going on in our school under the leadership of my colleague, um, Ms McColgan, is fantastic. Um, you only have to visit schools, and some of them, they've got it right at the front door, they're fo in the foyer, so there's that. Um, there's no signposting, there's no identifying who's coming up to, to use the bank, and it, it's very accessible. I also think the, the rollout of Parent Pay a few years ago, where all children just turn up and get their lunch. Nobody knows who's paid in advance and who's a free school meal. So all these sort of subtle things. But I think our schools really over the last 18 to 24 months have really upped their game and looking at costs. I think the challenge is that... Um, some of the experiences that you would like to offer young folk do cost money. And um, if, you're, if you are being, it's, it's a fine balance about making sure that you're still providing those experiences like trips and excursions away, but being very conscious that people maybe can't afford it. And that's where the PEF money can come in, where that opportunity to, to still offer those experiences, but heavily subsidise it, be very aware that don't have too many and, and what age group, and then I think our schools are, are working hard, but I think it's something that they, they will continually have to work on, especially with the current cost of living crisis that's impacting on everyone. We can't um, make assumptions about um, income or, or where people's financial um, status. I know from my 
lots of collaboration with the HSCP in a previous role I had that um, it's not, not necessarily aligned to certain postcodes where there's poverty. There's a lot of poverty in working households as well. So we really need to be conscious of um, looking at that universal support, but also having that targeted and subsidised for those that, that are identified um, as needing that wee bit of help. If I move on to the pupils living in SIMD 1 and 2, Although the Pupil Equity Fund and the Strategic Equity Fund, and you'll know that I brought a plan to committee in August that outlined our, our three years and indeed our, the focused one year of what we're going to do to target um, raising attainment and reducing that poverty-related attainment gap for children and entitled to that money. But we do have that flexibility, as the Director mentioned previously, to look at SIMD 1 and 2. And we would say in a lot of ways that's a, a clearer message for us um, and a clearer, uh, a clearer sign of who actually needs that, that additionality. So we have um, that detailed plan that went to committee in August where we are going to focus on the three areas, looking at literacy and numeracy, looking at readiness to learn, which is that wellbeing, making sure our children are attending, they're in school, they've got all the tools, they've got that um, emotional stability to be able to learn, but also looking at the pedagogy and looking at building the capacity of our staff to be able to differentiate and reach all those kids who may need a different approach to, to attaining to make sure they all have that deep learning. And it, the, the, comp, the, the, the authority SAFE plan is complemented by the school plans and you'll be aware that two head teachers came along to the last committee and showed how, although it was two very different contexts, Merns Castle and... Um, a primary school, St Mark's and Barhead, although the very different context, they were focusing on similar things. And I think that's that, that consistency of effort and approach and deployment of the resources that we have to, to really target those kids. Great. Thanks very much, Janice. And, and of course, with, with the work that's gone on in the early learning centres, perhaps with building in resilience for the future as well, even at that young, very young stage. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Merrick. Thank you, Janice. Uh, I believe Councillor Wallace. Thank you, Chair. The SIMD, we've, we've got the various categories. I'm just curious, have we ever kind of looked at the attainment gap between, say, one and two as opposed to one and five, and, and whether there's an advantage in kind of focusing so that we can do it in, in kind of gradual stages? Thank you. Uh, yeah, that's something that we, we do look at in terms of that analysis against you know, where we decide it's on one or two as a, as a focal point or spreading that more widely um, to say one to four versus those other um, quintiles or SINDs in terms of nine and ten. And some of the analysis that we do undertake and the targets that we do set our establishments will vary as a, in, a, in accordance with that. So as you quite rightly said, some of our establishments will have a very, very small number of children who reside in DSLs 1 to 2. And in fact, more widely, very small numbers of children who reside in DSLs 1 to 9, 1 to 8. And so accordingly, we will set and change our target setting for those establishments so that they may have a target that looks at and focuses on the performance of children in DSLs 1 to 8 against children in 9 and 10 because of the different demographics of their area. And conversely, we will do the same or differently for other establishments where they have a significant number of children in DSLs 1 to 2 or 1 to 4 with a very small number of children in that upper DSL area. And again, we will then change those targets for those different establishments based on their context. Yeah, I did just come back on that. I mean, I think everybody's kind of uh, feeling or, or kind of thoughts on, the, on this attainment gap is the assumption of the, the wealthy as opposed to extreme poverty and can we close that gap, whereas uh, perhaps we should be looking... We're never going to close that type of gap, but if we can start closing the gap between one and two and two and three and three and four and, and just and gradually start chipping away at it, then it's perhaps in the longer term we can start to get to the, the ultimate. So... Uh, just a thought, thanks. Yeah, but but you've 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 already. It would appear that you are taking that approach anyway. So thanks. Thank you, Councillor Wallace. Uh, any other notes or comments? Uh, the only thing I would like to mention is, uh, as part of the education committee met yesterday uh, with the director about um, the national discussion, and uh, one of the things that was talked about, I discussed, uh, was 
the literacy and numeracy of the building blocks of you know all learning, and but it was the consistency across you know um, into the attainment gap, the the every child to ultimately you you would like to achieve the highest level possible and. Uh, because then it, the effect of it is significant. So hopefully, well, that will be fed back. And I know that the director noted that about the consistency. So that will be being fed back as part of this national discussion. That helps. Okay. Uh, I'm so happy with no other questions or comments. Um, excellent. Thank you. And we'll move on to item number five now, uh, which is the and well, these papers are there's a there is a theme that flows through them. So. We're now going to talk to, about the Scottish Attainment Challenge stretch aims. I believe this is Joe. It is. Thank you, Convener. Yes. Uh, good morning again, everyone. Um, the report commencing on page 43 of the combined set of papers informs the Education Committee of the Department's proposal to seek approval for the proposed Scottish Attainment Challenge stretch aims. As members may recall, in August, Committee approved the Department's strategy of delivering excellence through equity, Strategic Equity Funding Plan, or more commonly known as our SAFE Plan, which has the objective of improving outcomes for children and young people in key equity groups, and in particular those impacted by poverty. At that meeting, the Education Committee requested that the Department provide further detail around the stretch aims as part of the SAFE plan. Local authorities were asked to set stretch aims for 2022-23 for the Scottish Attainment Challenge and to embed these within existing local authority plans. These stretch aims allow progress towards the objectives of the Attainment Challenge both locally and nationally to be measured, with progress updated annually, accompanied by subsequent statutory reporting and planning. The Education Department has been setting local stretch and gap targets for some time. This is an established part of the existing local authority quality improvement processes. On page 44 of your papers, paragraph 12 provides details of the core stretch aims, which are required to be set in order to measure progress towards raising the bar for all, whilst closing that poverty-related attainment gap. These measures focus on attainment in literacy and numeracy in the broad general education for children across the stages of P1, 4 and 7, attainment outcomes for young people in the senior phase, a wider outcome measure for young people across the age range of 16 to 19 years of age, known as the participation measure, as well as a locally identified health and wellbeing measure for which the department has identified school attendance. The measures not inclusive of attendance require to be aggregated nationally to provide a measure of success towards the objectives of the Scottish Attainment Challenge with national guidance indicating the measure of gap in attainment as a consequence of poverty determined by that Scottish Index of Multiple Deprivation. These core stretch aims set by the Department are detailed in pages 49 to 52 of your papers. Progress towards the stretch aims will be reported on an ongoing basis through the Council's Outcome Delivery Plan, Fair and Restrain Plan and uh, uh, the Department's Standards and Quality Report. The Director will also report progress annually to the Education Committee and wider stakeholders, as well as Education Scotland and Scottish Government. The Education Committee is asked to approve the proposed stretch aims and to ask the Director of Education to bring regular reports to the Committee on progress towards these. Thank you, Joe. Uh, can I ask for any comments or questions? I think uh, Councillor Dunham. Uh, thanks, Chair. Um, looking at these stretch aims, and I'm looking at page 50 and, and just picking on the first one, Corey target, um, and the improvement in the stretch gap is 1.6 percentage points, um, which sort of suggests, uh, if I'm reading this correctly, that it would take 10 years to eliminate the gap just on that measure. Is that what, is that sort of the pace and or that you're sort of thinking of, uh, or should I be thinking about it in a different way? And that sort of pace of 10 years is reflected in a lot of the other measures as well. Some are hi higher, some are, are, are lower. So I just want to get a sort of sense of, you know, is, is that a fair reflection or is there going to be an acceleration, et cetera? I'm happy to comment on that, um, Leader. So, some of the, um, the difficulty around this, and, and, and hopefully the presentation will show you a little bit more of the information, is that the format that we're required to submit this has to fit with the Scottish Government's um, requirements. So you'll see that the, the level that you've, you know, if you take that one that you picked for Core A, um, was around we have to display 2021's data. What we 
know is we've got 21-22's data. So we know the impact of that second year of the pandemic that reduced the overall levels even further. And what you'll see particularly for quintile one is that we're not at 77 percent. We're actually much lower than that because, as we were just talking about, the, the, the uh, page that Councillor uh, Campbell was highlighting. So actually, it, it, it distorts then the figures for you. And actually, if we were to add another, call, or another row in and show you what the, the current baseline is and where we're now trying to work, um, bearing in mind that we're submitting these in, in October, schools have then essentially only got kind of eight months to bring about the improvement. So there's a little bit of a frustration for me in, in the approach that the Scottish Government are adopting. I, I, the, I accept your point, though, and what you hopefully will see is that ambition that we have, um, where we're seeking, first of all, by the end of this year, to be back to the kind of levels we were pre-COVID, and then continuing to build on that. Some of the other stretch aims, uh, I'll maybe highlight the, um, the course, uh, course C, no, Core B, um, which is the, the one or more at level five. Um, and again, Elected members might be asking questions around why those percentages are quite so small, um, but actually the current level in 2021 um, is sitting at close to 97%. We're, there's, there's very little movement, and that goes back to the relevance, and it perhaps picks up your question earlier, about the appropriateness of those targets. That wouldn't be a measure we would choose ordinarily to do. We would look at something like um, levers achieving five or more awards at level six, so a much higher sort of standard, and you'll see those reflected in our own core plus targets. Um, so I think to answer your point, we are absolutely ambitious, but I think the sort of format of the, you know, the, what we're required to submit doesn't perhaps allow us to reflect that. And there are kind of more significant questions perhaps sitting underneath that in terms of um, the way that some of that information is, is displayed by Scottish Government going forward. Thank you, Mark. Uh, Councillor Donald. Any other questions or comments on this? Great, thank you. Um, okay, I believe now we'll move on to the last item, which is the uh, presentation from the director. And we're trying to coordinate this so that obviously folk can see it here and online. I'm hoping if I maybe stand over there and yeah. the camera will spin round. If not, okay. will, it, will it manage that? Um, I'd rather stand up, I feel like... slightly odd uh, format. I now definitely feel like I'm giving a lecture or something, so, or maybe I'm at church or something. So um, anyway, good morning, everybody. What we've tried to design this presentation to do is to provide elected members um, with some of that detailed analysis, uh, looking at the sort of broad general education, so primary schools, and then on into the, the senior phase. Um, there we go. So it's in two main parts. We'll look at the, first of all, the broad general education or primary attainment, uh, and then we'll look at the senior phase. Uh, in both cases, we'll look at it from sort of two lenses. We'll look at it in terms of excellence. We'll also look at it in terms of equity uh, and examine, you know, how successful we've been or otherwise. And some of those themes have been coming up this morning. Uh, and what I'll do at the end is just illustrate it with some case studies from two particular schools that um, are, are demonstrating some of the work, some of the interventions that our schools are doing to try and bring about some of the improvements that you'll see. And I hope what it will do is it'll, um, give elected members, give committee um, some of that evidence, some of that detail in terms of how well we are progressing and, and picking up really sort of um, Councillor O'Donnell's question about making sure that uh, committee are able to scrutinise our performance in some of, some of our key priorities. Um, what is important in terms of um, as we're, we're going through some of this analysis is, is taking account of the sort of demographic of our pupils and some of that again has come out um, this morning. Um, and we need to take account of that context, both at a local authority level and uh, at a school level. And, and that's crucial in helping us identify where we can uh, see best practice, uh, where can we highlight um, areas for improvement, um, a little bit like Councillor Campbell was highlighting, how do we share some of that 
uh, and make sure that we're benchmarking appropriately. And we, we've touched on um, sort of nationally and internationally uh, the, the difference that poverty makes in terms of attainment. We know that there's that strong link. Um, and this particular chart just gives you an indication of our seven secondary schools. So across the bottom it goes from William Wood, Mans Castle, St Ninian's, Eastwood, Wood Farm, St Luke's and Barhead. And the, the chart displays the proportion of pupils in the different uh, deciles. So it starts with uh, quintiles one and two, that's the, the green bars. So somewhere like St Luke's and Barhead, you can see it's around about 30% of the pupils come from uh, quintiles, uh, quintile one. Um, and then it moves through uh, the yellow into the blue, and then the sort of maroon colour is those that are in quintile five, the most affluent uh, backgrounds, and you can see the sort of proportion across our schools. So across East Renfrewshire, um, you can see um, the, the average SIMD we sometimes talk about is around about eight. Somewhere like Williamwood is 9.2, somewhere like Barhead around about 5.2, and it's making sure that we're doing fair comparisons then. You would not expect the attainment to be the same in somewhere like Barhead as it is in Williamwood, and it's about making sure that we're challenging all of our schools suitably in that way. So we're going to start looking at the, the broad general education. We're going to look at reading, writing, talking, listening and maths. Uh, you can see on the screen our sort of local improvement target is around that improved reading, writing and maths attainment throughout the years of the broad general education given the importance of that. Um, and, and what I'm going to put up is a sort of what I've called a scorecard um, and it will summarise the performance of our primary schools in terms of primary attainment, P1, P4, P7, um, and the percentage of pupils achieving the expected levels. And it, it hopefully brings to life some of those tables that you were just looking at. So in 2021-22, um, we had 89% of our primary pupils achieving the expected levels in reading. You can see in green the, na the latest national average, um, and there's the, the decrease, uh, so a 2% decrease um, since 2018-19. And we've picked that point because that was pre uh, COVID in that way. And as I bring in uh, the other four, the other three curricular areas, you can see that that pattern has been repeated in terms of the overall attainment. So we've seen that sort of small decrease uh, from where we were in 1819 to the sort of current value. So our schools, you can still see, are performing very well compared to the latest national average. Uh, we would expect that given East Renfrewshire's demographic. What is not as visible on this particular slide is the variation uh, in terms of uh, the, at a school level picking up the, d the different demographics and you'll see more of that uh, as we move into having a look at the equity section. So there's a bit of a delay in clicking. So, <laughs> um, so we'll, we'll move into looking at advancing equity and, and, and um, I suppose pick up some of those themes in terms of you know, what about pupils from the uh, more disadvantaged backgrounds uh, and what are we doing in terms of, of equity and how does that sit with those stretch aim targets as, as we were just talking about. So looking first of all at um, reading. So this is, um, shows you three years across the, um, the bottom. Uh, we've got 2018-19, then 2021 uh, and 2022. And there's three bars, as you can see, for each. Uh, you've got the overall bar which um, mirrors just what you've seen on the previous scorecard. So in 2019, uh, the overall attainment was 91%, and there's been that steady decrease, 90% and 89%. Um, so marginal decreases in that way. But you can see then two other groups, children that are registered for free school meals, and then children that are living in deciles one and two. And what you can see there is that that pattern, as Councillor Campbell was highlighting, has been much more significant, the drop, for those living in deciles one and two. Now, what I would also highlight on that chart is there's some numbers. So next to the, the various labels across the, the horizontal axis, and that's the number of children or pupils each year. And that is actually quite important given that uh, overall, we've got a kind of cohort of around about 4,000 children there, around about 1,300 each year. But those living in uh, deciles one and two, you can see it's a much smaller number, 244. And that is also probably related to your question, I think, around the numeracy, that there's, there, there's more sub-fluctuation, I suppose, when you've got much smaller cohorts like that. And that's why we need to look at the, the trend data. Similar charts then, oh, there's boys and girls. Um, that was also something Councillor O'Donnell was kind of raising earlier. So you can see that that attainment gap uh, overall 
in terms of reading is, is significant, about 5.5%. So we continue to need to do more work around supporting boys' attainment, um, and, and that would really kind of goes back to some of the this discussion that Janice was mentioning earlier. Similar chart then just for numeracy, just to give you that same pattern. Um, and you can see overall that decrease of around about 1% uh, for those living uh, and registered for free school meals, a decrease of 4%. Um, and then a sort of slightly strange pattern in that the baseline year uh, in 2019, uh, it was much lower, it was 60%. So overall, you've got that um, uh, increase of 8% that was being highlighted. What I would say, though, is when you look still at the gap between the overall picture, um, it's still over 20%. So overall, 90%, and those living in deciles 1 and 2, 22% um, lower. And that's similar to, to, to reading in that way. Now, what we, we um, have been looking at is our stretch aims. So that was in the previous paper. And this is a very similar chart. You've still got that um, three bars in each case, the three years but the three bars now represent all pupils, those living in uh, quintile 1, or deciles 1 and 2, and then those living uh, in 9 and 10. And what you can see there is that that pattern shows you that overall decrease, those living in quintile 1 and 2 showing a decrease of around about 4%, and those actually in 9 and 10 staying pretty much the same, actually a slight increase of 1%. And what we're trying to do is make sure that by the end of this year, We've gone to 91% overall, so back to that 2019 level, we've brought up our quintile 1 and 2 up to around about 80%, and then we're seeing that marginal increase. So it's about, uh, you'll have heard us use the phrase before, it's about raising the bar for all. We want to see everybody's attainment improve. We don't want to see others drop in that way, but we want to see the attainment of those uh, that need it most rising at a faster rate. And if we do that, you can see that the, uh, there'll be a corresponding reduction in the attainment gap from where it is at the moment of around about 23%, uh, it will reduce uh, to around about 15%. Uh, and finally, in just the broad general education, showing you the equivalent picture in literacy um, with our stretch aims that were in that previous paper, wanted to try and do the same thing, uh, bring um, our literacy levels up. And, and, and that maybe perhaps answers some of your question, Councillor O'Donnell, in that when you look at the longer trend, Actually, last year there was still that ongoing impact of, of uh, COVID in that way. So moving now to look at um, the senior phase and the SQA examinations. And this builds on um, the statement that uh, Joe gave you in August. And we said at that point we would come back with more detail and show you particularly some of the, the equity measures. I wanted to just to start by staying with literacy and numeracy and provide an education committee with some detail around literacy and numeracy, and then we'll look more broadly. But one of the key things that, particularly for newer members to the committee, is this concept of a virtual comparator. Uh, so if you've not come across this before, this is a, a way of helping us again to do benchmarking, to make sure that we're comparing like with like. Um, and what they do is it's a part of a national tool that's, uh, that's included in what's called the Insight Benchmarking uh, Tool, that uh, all local authorities have access to. And for each pupil in a school or in a local authority, they compare their attainment with 10 pupils of similar characteristics. So the characteristics are that they ha are the same gender, they have the same additional support needs, uh, they're in the same stage, and they come from the same uh, uh, decile in terms of the Scottish Index of Multiple Deprivation. And that means then, if it, whether you're looking at Williamwood, whether you're looking at St. Luke's, whether you're looking at Barhead, whether you're looking at East Renfrewshire as a whole, we're looking at and saying what should the attainment be or how does it compare to that across the whole of Scotland. And that's a very useful tool in helping us identify uh, our gaps or where there are areas for further improvement. And you'll see that on a number of the slides. Um, so this first slide shows you Lever's attainment in literacy and numeracy over a five-year period at four different levels. So uh, 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 starting at level four, that would be the lowest level there. Level five and level six would be the equivalent of higher. You can see that at level four and level six has been that sort of steady improvement. Um, the red bars show you our virtual comparator. So that's that like for like comparison. And you can see it's pretty close at level four and five, but when you get to level six, East Renfrewshire pupils far more likely uh, to achieve a level six award in a, a sort of literacy and numeracy level. 
The green bars give you the national average, and again, significantly outperforming uh, 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 the national average. And I'll not go into it, I don't really have time for it this morning to go into the sort of literacy and numeracy strategies, but a uh, committee might want to pick up some of those kind of questions uh, ar around that um, going forward. Probably just as we're moving into this senior phase, it's worth just highlighting and reminding committee that there are a number of different um, sort of assessment approaches captured on these screens. 2019 was what you would call a traditional exam approach. 2020, COVID hit in March, the exams were cancelled and um, SQA asked schools to infer the attainment. Um, 2021, we had what was called the alternative certification model really robust approach around teacher judgments. Um, and then 2022, we went back to examinations. So I would just ask you to exercise a degree of caution, given the, the sort of picture that is there nationally. It does make some of those comparisons a little bit more difficult. Um, so moving then into sort of improved presentations um, and showing you some of the fourth and fifth year attainment uh, across our schools, uh, starting with... Um, making sure that we're getting the learners onto the right courses. Our, our approach is always, whether we're talking about fourth, fifth, or sixth years, making sure learners can be successful, that they have the right pathways. And this gives you uh, an indication of the success in terms of the National Five presentations. So that's the highest level that they could be presented at, at national uh, in S4, and then the set success in terms of the proportion achieving A to C awards. So in 2019... 86% of our fourth years were presented at National 5, the highest possible level, and the pass rate was around about 90.5%. And you can then see how that varies in 2021 with the ACM model, the alternative certification model, and then in 2022. And, and I'm really pleased to see that that uh, presentation level's actually got a slight increase there. It's gone from 86% to nearly 88%, and actually the pass rate has stayed pretty similar. There's variation within the schools, and you'll see that in a moment in the individual slides. And what we've been doing is making sure then that our head teachers are sharing that practice. And you'll see it in some of the case studies later on in terms of what is making a difference. How are they managing to get those improved A to C awards uh, based on the presentations? So showing you um, now at an individual school level, you can see the seven schools across uh, the horizontal axis through to East Renfrewshire on the right-hand side. Um, it's got four years' worth of data, so those four different assessment approaches. Um, broadly, at an authority level, our attainment has stayed around about the same. We're sitting at about 77%. It's just below where we were in 2019, which had been our best result to date. What is, I think, important and helpful to look at, that red line is the national average. So all of our schools performing well above the national average, and Barhead and St. Luke's, their cohort, their catchment, would be around about national average. So actually, you can see how well they're performing. And then across the top, I put just in sort of shorthand, VC, that's their virtual comparator. So if I take an example, Eastwood, right in the middle, Eastwood's had their best ever results this year, 85%, outstanding performance. Doing a like-for-like -like comparison of children in Eastwood, the virtual comparator would be 53%. So they're significantly outperforming, and all our schools are well above their virtual comparator. Looking at uh, S5, uh, there's the picture. This is five or more awards at, at level six, just one of the measures. And again, if you put in the national average and the virtual comparator, uh, some very strong performances. I would probably highlight uh, Wood Farm um, towards the middle there and Barhead. We were absolutely delighted with both schools' results there the best they'd had, and that's going back to uh, actual assessments in that way rather than the ACM model. And again, if you use the virtual comparator to get a sense of how well those schools are performing, you can see it's, it's really a very, very strong picture um, indeed. Some, somewhere they were probably a little bit more disappointed um, and just you know, making sure that we're picking that up in, in these presentations. Um, William Wood and Mans Castle, a little bit disappointed with their fifth-year results. Sixth-year results, interestingly, quite strong. Um, I ran out of time to put all those slides in, but actually they're going away and looking at their learning and teaching and really focusing on that uh, to bring about that improvement and seeing a dip, I suppose they would say, in some of that post-COVID and using this year to build that back uh, to previous levels. And just to sort of finish, to give elected members, that's the sort of 
proportion achieving a number of awards, but actually we're interested in that depth, that quality of the award in terms of preparing young people for success after school. And that gives you an idea um, across the horizontal axis, the years, and that's uh, the proportion of our uh, fourth years achieving eight or more A to C awards. So a really quite significant measure. Um, and we were pleased to see that in 2022, it was just slightly above where we were in 2019. Uh, the proportion then achieving eight or more A awards, now up to 22%, which is absolutely fantastic. And that improvement that you see in fourth year then improves those opportunities that those young people have in fifth year and sixth year. And if I show you the number of young people uh, across the authority achieving five or more A's at higher, it was 240 last year or 17%. It's a, a really very, very impressive in terms of the work that schools are doing to make sure that all young people are given that opportunity uh, to achieve at the very highest level. Final little section then, I just wanted to show you uh, and pick up the equity section. Very, very important to say, are we also doing as well for different groups of learners? Um, and again, for a, a new committee, highlighting uh, something that perhaps many of you might be familiar with. You might have seen it at various parent council meetings. Insight tariff points. So rather than looking at the, um, the, the different grades, uh, each grade is given a set of points. So you can see a national five grade A is given 84 points, higher 204 points. And what that means is then you can total up the points a young person achieves. There's an example on the screen there. And it allows you then to look at different groups of pupils. So you could look at boys and girls and look at the average points that they achieve and try and drill into the sort of different gaps. And we'll use that in a couple of the next slides. So first of all, really importantly, looking at uh, the, the points, uh, but based on deprivation. So three groups of learners across the bottom are most deprived learners, those in uh, deciles one, two, and three. A middle group, so that's uh, deciles four to seven, and then deciles eight to 10. Um, you can see five years worth of attainment, uh, and you can see the pattern. The red bar is the national average. So our learners in deciles one, two, and three, the average points they achieved was 491. Nationally, it would be 320. And the virtual comparator is underneath the label. It, um, you can see that measured. And, and what is pleasing to see is that those learners over that period have increased by 10%, the middle group by 2%, and it's, it's basically steady at the, the top end because there's there's little room for headroom uh, at, at that point. Uh, and that's really, I suppose, indicative of what we're trying to do, raise the bar for all, but at the same time close the gap for those that, that need it most. And you can see the impact that there has been there um, for the most disadvantaged group. We also, and, and Janice referred to it earlier, pick up the, in terms of pupil equity funding, that's based around uh, learners entitled to free school meals. So we've had a real sort of focus with our schools uh, are looking at the proportion of our learners that achieve five or more awards um, in fourth year or fifth year um, uh, that are entitled to free school meals. Now, remember, the overall proportion here is around about 80%. So we're not satisfied that at an East Renfrewshire level, we're sitting at 55%. We want to try and get that as close as possible so that whether you're registered for free school meals or not, your attainment outcomes look the same. And it stayed fairly steady. And I think that's partly the impact that we've seen of COVID um, and actually if the work that our schools were putting in wasn't taking place, I think that would have gone down further actually uh, in, in terms of that. The significant variation at a school level, clearly somewhere like Wood Farm has, has done a very strong job. But again, important to look at the numbers that are sitting under each school. In some cases, it's very, very small numbers. So somewhere like William Wood has 300 in S4, uh, and only 10 learners that are registered for free school meals. So it's about those individual pupils. Although we're looking at it as a sort of group on the screen, actually from a school level, they're tracking those as individual learners, which goes back to sort of Councillor Wallace's question about looking at, you were talking about the sort of different deciles and about it's essentially making sure we're, we're supporting individuals and meeting their needs. And then one final chart to, to show you, um, committee members that have uh, uh, were here previously, will be familiar with these bubble plots. This is one of the national benchmarking uh, charts that they use. Um, and it uh, takes, it compares uh, pupils' attainment on the, the vertical axis against the horizontal axis is a, a measure of deprivation. So it goes from the least affluent, uh, deciles one and two, to the most affluent. 
The size of the bubble or uh, circle is indicative of the proportion that you have. So that's East Rempressures, where you know that decels 9 and 10, we have the most pupils. And then obviously as an indication of where those pupils are performing, so the average sort of attainment. And what we're looking to do is have that uh, line as high as possible and as flat as possible. And that would be an indication of excellence and equity. Um, and you can see how our schools perform against... Um, the virtual comparator, it's a very strong picture for every decile they're outperforming. I think that does go into your question though, Councillor Wallace, you can still see variation. You can see um, quintile three, for instance, uh, decile three, sorry, uh, performing above decile four that year. And that will be where schools will need to look at their own individual bubble plot. Um, and actually what they can also do is they can look at uh, those that vary within that and actually look at individual pupils and say, okay, this is an average. What does it mean for the individuals within that group? And that's very, very important. And then just showing you the comparison nationally. So you can see nationally the red circles are all basically the same size because there should be the same proportion in each decile. So I wanted just to, to finish very briefly to try and bring it, it to life in terms of the, the work that our quality improvement, the leadership team are doing supporting our schools. We're out in regular meetings got a series of meetings with our secondary schools coming up, particularly focusing on the SQA results. And it's about those collaborative approaches. Often we'll be joined by uh, colleagues from other schools to hear some of those uh, areas and focus on, on where uh, schools have self-evaluated their progress and where we need further improvement. And I've picked um, one example from Eastwood High School. They had a, a sort of universal and targeted support, and it's interesting that came up earlier. Um, you can see uh, the range of approaches that they were, were using to bring about the improvements, and you, you saw the clear impact it had had. In terms of that universal support, um, I think for them, uh, the head teacher, if she was here, would highlight those robust monitoring and tracking processes, that holistic approach you can see there in terms of well-being as well as attainment. And you can get an indication of just the success that they had as you move from their prelims through to the final results in terms of the proportion achieving, for instance, five or more awards in fourth year or fifth year and the, the impact that that had had. And a specific example around numeracy, they targeted pupils that had achieved essentially less than a, a B in their prelim. So pretty high bar, you could argue. That for them, it was their bottom 60 pupils. Um, they used uh, additional funding to, to have those evening supported study classes, really successful in terms of the attendance and the the engagement that they had with learners, and you can see that by the end of that process, they had just under, uh, just over 93% achieving uh, their national five in, in maths, and the, the, the marks, uh, the pass rate increasing significantly. And then the last case study, a very different one. Um, oh, let's jump too quickly. This looks at OLM and a work that they did around family learning uh, to support literacy uh, uh, attainment. Uh, for bilingual uh, learners. Um, and this is a fantastic sort of example. They, tug, they had a look at the, a range of factors on the left-hand side that were contributing to that. They selected then 12 bilingual learners in primary two to four. Uh, they used a range of indicators on the right-hand side, um, and they ran at a lunchtime language and culture club, really focused on sharing aspects of their home language, their culture, taking part in structured activities, and the focus all the time, as Janice was talking about, is on that um, developing of that oral literacy and then moving that into sort of writing skills. Once those, that confidence was built um, through those, some of those activities, they also then invited families in. And there's strong research to show that if you can develop family learning well, it not only supports the families more effectively, uh, but it helps the, the children, it improves their attainment and their engagement and confidence. And um, the program was, was so successful that they moved very quickly from those original 12 learners uh, to add uh, some additional uh, 17 learners from primary five to seven. And down the right-hand side, that sort of color coding uh, is the school's sort of uh, traffic lighting um, in terms of the impact of the 29 pupils. And they used a range of kind of uh, qualitative and quantitative, including attainment, uh, pupils' uh, confidence, their ability to use language in class. They did a really uh, successful uh, sort of event at the end celebrating they've had a number of the adults so the families now being signposted through into adult learning classes and taking part in 
uh, some of the adult literacy opportunities that we have across the department, and they've decided to run that again uh, this year. Um, and it's, it's had those wider benefits, I suppose I would say, in terms of pupil confidence, understanding of that bilingualism, um, involving that in, and improving that parental engagement, uh, some work around digital technology, um, and really sharing, I suppose, some of the uh, bilingual learners' uh, understanding and, and, and showing their improving their language skills. That was a bit of a whistle-stop tour. Um, I wasn't sure that we would spend quite as long on the first set of papers, so I hope that that has been helpful to committee in terms of seeing some of the evidence. Um, I think Councillor O'Donnell's point earlier on was a really helpful one in terms of making sure that we're looking at some of the other equity groups, and we will do that in future presentations and also in things like our standards and quality report that you'll see. Um, I think there's some very strong results there, but we're not complacent. Um, and I, I hopefully that comes through in terms of our, our measure. The quote I've just put on the screen for you is from a book I read last year. Uh, if you've not read it, I would highly recommend it, a book uh, called Better by Atul Gwandi. He is a surgeon. He's not a, an educationalist. But he looks at the area of medicine and how do you bring about improvements in medicine. And he talks about diligence, ingenuity, and the means to do what is right. And I think that is what... Um, hopefully our schools demonstrate what you've seen a little bit of this morning. We have a really clear vision. We focus on those marginal gains. We look constantly about striving to bring about that improvement. But there is something about that moral purpose, about driving that improvement for, for all our learners, raising the bar, but also for those that need us most. And I'll stop at that point. Happy to take questions, convener, or... Uh, Thank there's you. people here that can answer the questions better than me if there's hard ones. Thank you, director, or, well, teacher. <laughs> I think uh, you can tell. Oh, microphone. Yeah. Excellent. Thanks very much. I think, uh, Councillor Devlin. Just a question to Mark in regards to the, the attainment levels. I mean, the, the, the attainment levels in Eastwood side are fantastic. There's no doubt about it. I've got concerns about the Levern Valley side. I mean, I've been on the, the Education Committee now for 15 years. And, you know, we've always seen, you know, the, I'll use St Luke's as an example. You know, it was a benchmark for, you know, bar head high, take up or go above it. I mean, Gordon actually touched it, you know, basically touched it to perfection when he said that, you know, instead of looking at 1 to 10, look at 1 to 2. I'm looking at the, the, the attainment levels, and I notice Barhead Tire have leaked St. Luke's. Am I right in saying that? Is that not a concern? I mean, the, as you know, Councillor Devon, you've been on committee for, for, for a while. It's reversed the conversation we were having, where in the past people would have been saying, are you concerned about Barhead's attainment? And actually, um, the head teacher, the staff, they've been really... Um, investing in improving learning and teaching. They've done a real focus on children's well-being, uh, children's rights, and I think you're seeing that the fruit of that. I mean, their attainment was absolutely outstanding. Um, you know, the, the number of children achieving five hires was 31%. It was the best they'd ever had. I mean, that's a, absolute. What I would say is that St. Luke's attainment is still high. It's just that now you've got Bar Head outperforming them. But if you compare it, St. Luke's to its virtual comparator or to, its, uh, to the national average, St. Luke's performs well. Now, St. Luke's are not satisfied with where they're at. Yeah. They're looking to... So, actually, the two schools work very closely. So, um, the head teacher from St. Luke's immediately will, you know, obviously get in touch with Barhead. They also work on some of those areas. The other thing I would probably point to to try and perhaps provide some reassurance is that in terms of the lever destinations, which I think is a really good measure of where our young people go once they finish school, St. Luke's and Barhead were the two highest schools across the whole authority last year. Um, they, had over they had over 99 per cent of their learners in a positive destination. So they beat all the schools on the, on the east of the authority. Um, Another point I picked up, you know, you know, it comes to the deprivation index. You look at the Eastwood side to the bar head side, the attainment level is not picking up the way it should pick up in the deprived areas. I'm, I'm not sure I would agree with the 
that categorization. I would, yeah. I would say that I would, I would say that the, the performance in terms of the, um, those two schools is, is strong in both. And what we want to see is see further improvements to St Luke's. I'm just explaining, you know, the, the, about the, the money's been put into the, the private parts of Scotland, you know, to bring up basically the pass marks, and it's doesn't seem to be happening. Okay, I, I think it's noted. Take that. Thanks very much, Councillor Devlin. Uh, any other comments? Uh, sorry, uh, Mr. Morris. I, I, thanks, Chair. Um, th thanks for that, Director. And if, one thing I have learned when I come to this Education Committee, I need to make sure I've got my glasses with me so that I can read everything. Uh, from experience, I've learned that. Um, it, it was really just th thanks for that. For that. I, I know it hasn't been common practice in the past, but I'm just wondering if the presentation could be made available to, to committee members, emailed to them. Um, I, I, I don't know if that's possible or not. I know that it's quite interactive. and We, we have to be careful because of the, um, some of the information that I included around the sort of virtual comparator, the, um, so some of that benchmarking data is made available for local authorities to support improvement, but there's a kind of disclaimer on the website around not sharing it more widely. So that is why I'm sort of reluctant to do some of the to send out the slides in that way. Um, it's probably best if we don't send the, the slides out in this particular case, just because of. Um, so we, that's why we tried to capture some of the information in things like the National Improvement Framework and also uh, the Standards and Quality Report. Oh, thanks, Mr. Morris. I, I was actually going to ask the same thing, um, and, but, but I did anticipate that possibly there would be, you know, what um, Mark's mentioned, uh, some of the content, uh, and not wanting to give you additional work, but is it possible to try and um, then strip some of that out? But, but still get, you know, uh, the bigger picture, or I, I guess you would use some, lose some of the granularity or the in depth. But is that possible? I mean, we could. I, I just wonder whether some of that is already available through things like the standards and quality report, and individual schools also do their standards and quality report. So, if there's particular areas like that and things like that, the national improvement framework uh, paper that Janice brought also has quite a. It doesn't have it except it doesn't have it in the nice visual format, um, but it, it has some of that information in there. We can have a look and see if there's, um, on some of the slides, I can perhaps do a reduced version that, that wouldn't get me into trouble with the Scottish Government for, for sending out the, the slides. <laughs> <laughs> if there is particular things that, we, that, that you, it's not been previously reported in the standards and quality that you, from that that you want included, we could... Um, Try and present it in that way, but not give the the virtual comparator. Well, it's just that it's, it's in an excellent format. I think it's just, and I, I that's why we're we, that's I mean, you're your own you're a victim of your own success. I'll, I'll see what was, I'll see what, so what we can good. do, convener. <laughs> and it was so informative, and you know, so incredibly important. Um, and I think you can tell, you know, the the committee obviously um, very interested in it. But if you can possibly, um, then very much appreciated. Councillor Walsh. Uh, thank you. I was just going to say, uh, just to thank the director for uh, the kind of candid approach that he, he, he gives to all this information, a huge amount of information. I, I noted the, uh, the uh, quote that you had at the end from the, the person from a, a medical background about the willingness to um, improve, etc. Uh, from what I can understand in aeronautics, uh, if, if, if medicine followed the aeronautics uh, model, then we'd all be living till we're about 150. And the great thing about aeronautics is we've got a black box. Uh, that you can't really hide anything. And what I'll just say thank you to the director for producing his own black box. I, I think because the more information you provide, then the more um, you can be criticised for, for the information that you're providing. Uh, we can maybe talk about Decile 6 at a later point. Maybe also. Um, so, um, yeah, d just to thank. And I, I, would su I suggest that uh, maybe a, a lot of the success that we're having in East Renfrewshire is to the candid nature which uh, the Education Department does provide all these statistics and allow us to properly scrutinise and hopefully improve for the benefit of our children. Thank you.
Frank, sorry, can you hear me? Yeah, can we... Yes, thank you, convener. Um, I just thought it would be appropriate to thank Dr. Ratter for that very comprehensive and excellent report and think it's very positive to see the work that the schools and the education department um, have been producing such excellent results. And what I'm really relieved at is that the effect of COVID does not seem to have had a great adverse effect on results. And I think it shows great resilience. And I think we owe a lot of congratulations to all the people involved. Thank you. Thanks for that comment, Frank. I'm sure it's well received. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Buchanan, sorry, yes. Yeah, thanks, Chair, and thanks, Mark, for a, an excellent presentation. And I think what it does show, uh, and Gordon alluded to it, is the importance of data and the information that we have. But, of course, the real value in that is what we then do with that data. And I think it's a great credit uh, to the Council and to the leadership team that we take that, that data and we go and we identify the issues and we make sure that we try and put fixes in place uh, and work on those issues and hopefully then improve on the information and the outcomes uh, in particular that we look for. So thanks very much for that presentation. Thank you, Councillor Buchanan. Councillor O'Donnell. Uh, I, again, I echo what Councillor Buchanan said. I think that was an excellent presentation. And actually having a presentation with bar graphs, and this is your maths coming in, um, from, and again, my maths as well. I love that. Actually, it was so crystal clear in terms of where we are in detail by school. Really, really helpful. And in particular, it's the first time I've seen that as the virtual comparator by school. I think that's very, very encouraging because a lot of our residents will say, you know, compare, I don't want to pick on that point, St. Luke's to uh, William Wood, and it's not a fair comparison for lots of reasons, which is clear. But the, the comparison to the virtual comparator is, is, is clear. Clearly, we're doing much better there than, that, than we should do in the national sort of perspective. So that's very helpful. Um, what's also very clear today is that there is no complacency within the education department. That's absolutely clear in terms of how you, you've uh, prepared the papers and, and how you've responded to all the questions, that there is no complacency, which I'm sure the members here are really encouraged by. And more importantly, not just us, but, but the, the residents in East Renfrewshire to see that we're always striving to attain even more, which is very encouraging indeed. Thank, so thank you. Thank you, Councillor O'Donnell. And that's great. Thanks very much. Is there any other final comments or notes? No. Um, well, uh, yeah, apologies that this has went on. <laughs> I did say at the start that we tried, but well, I, I very much appreciate the contribution from um, all the members. I, I think it's, it shows you the value that we all place on this, uh, and I very much appreciate it. So, with no further ado, then I'll close the meeting. Thank you. Thank you.